fellowship. It's good to go and see family and friends and loved ones that we've known in time past to associate with them, but it's always great to come back home and to, to see your own driveway and to, uh, to enjoy the comforts of being back at home. There is no place on earth like home, home sweet home. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of um, being wide awake, being a wide awake Christian. Uh, there have always been people, I suspect, that have gone to sleep in church services. Eutychus is mentioned, of course, as Paul came uh, across the Troas and uh, preached till midnight. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we find that there was a young man sitting in a window, and it was late at night, I'm sure, when he was sitting in the window, and he was slumped down and fell and uh, was taken up, and uh, uh, Paul revived him, and this man's name was Eutychus. He was not the only person that slept in church. And uh, if you have problems sleeping in church, Maybe we ought to do what uh, one preacher did. <laughs> one preacher got up and said to the person next to someone out there who was sleeping, would you wake brother so-and-so up? And the fellow who was sitting beside him said, uh, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> so I will probably not try that trick anyway. But we do need to be wide awake. I'm not talking about sleeping in services. I'm talking about the matter of being someone who is wide awake far as the work of the Lord's church is concerned. And this passage that was read in our hearing just a moment ago from the 13th chapter of the book of Romans says it is high time that we awake out of sleep. Indeed, that is the case. The Lord's church, I believe, is a sleeping giant. I'm talking about spiritually and as far as the opportunities that are before us. The Lord's Church is one that has tremendous prospects and possibilities and yet in many cases we are asleep to those opportunities, asleep to those possibilities and we need, as this passage would say, we need to love one another. The passage makes that point in verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time is now, it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ, who have served the Lord for a great many years, are closer to the end, is what he's saying. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believe. When one first becomes a Christian, they are so enthusiastic. They are so wide awake to the opportunities. They're just thrilled that they have been able to know the truth and obey the gospel of Christ. Uh, it's always a thrill to me to baptize someone into Christ. I remember one lady that I baptized into Christ, and there I was in the baptistry with her. She came up wet as everything and turned right around and threw her arms around me and got me as wet as she was. Of course, I was wearing baptistry boots, but not, not on my tie and not on my white shirt and everything. But I, I, wasn't, I wasn't upset at all. It is a thrilling experience. It is a new birth. People are born again of the water and of the Spirit. Their sins washed away, as Jesus would say, their names written on the Lamb's Book of Life, and it is a wonderful occasion. We indeed ought to be grateful for it. But when we think with regard to the matter of the work of the Lord's Church, we ought not to be asleep. The passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 speaks with regard to elders in the Lord's church to the effect that they are to be vigilant, sober. That means that they are to be absolutely wide awake. But not only are elders in the church to be awake, all of us are to be awake. Awake thou that sleepest, the scripture we'll look at in just a moment, will suggest to us, wake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and I will give thee light. The Lord wants us to be awake. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the light of the world. You remember the statement in John, the first chapter, in him was life and life was the light of men. Jesus is the light of the world and that light would shine in darkness. The scripture makes the point with regard to it in the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. We find it saying uh, that then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John, well, it's, Let's see, the passage that I'm really looking for is 4 and 
and verse 14. I looked in the wrong chapter there. It's verse 4 and 14 where it says, uh, Now that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, the prophet saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond Jordan, of Galilee, of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them that sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those that sat in darkness saw a great light. That great light is Jesus Christ. All of us need to see the light. We need to see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, and we need to awake out of our sleep as this would suggest. Now, sleep is a wonderful thing. If people do not get enough sleep, they, their health will be affected. It is certainly something serious if a person is affected to the point that he cannot sleep. He simply tosses all night long and can't any, get any sleep. But while we are to get the proper amount of rest, we are to realize that the purpose of life is really brought forth while we are, while we are awake, while we are wide awake and able to do the jobs that we need, able to accomplish the things that are set before us day by day. And it is certainly a, a, a situation that is tragic when people are, are not able to sleep as they should. I heard about a little boy. This little boy uh, was listening to some men talk, and the men were talking about their dogs. One said his dog was a, uh, a pointer, and the other said his dog was a setter. So this little boy rushed home to ask his daddy, what about our dog? Is our dog a pointer or a setter? Daddy said, our dog is a disappointer and an upsetter. And may I suggest, even though some of our dogs are like that, they're disappointers and upsetters, we keep them for sentimental purposes. We love the old dog anyway, even though he may not be educated or everything that he might be. We're not to be in the Lord's kingdom. We're not to be people who are disappointers and upsetters. We are to serve the purpose that God would have us to serve, and we are to strive to do that as the Lord would direct us to do that, and uh, we are to, to use the opportunities that we have. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, should awaken people. He should awaken the people as far as the world is concerned. It looks back, I look back to the, uh, the book of Isaiah and find that there were those who were disappointed in Jesus. They simply found that he was not what they expected to be. And they were disappointed in him. He disappointed them, and he upset them. And there were problems along that line. In Isaiah chapter 53, we find it saying with regard to, to our Lord that he was wounded for our transgressions. He says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They turned their faces away from him. The leaders of the Jews rejected him and did everything they could in order to get him finally put to death. They simply did not appreciate that which Jesus was teaching. They did not appreciate the things that he came to do. He did not fit into the idea that they had of what the Messiah was to be. But we need to recognize our need to be wide awake and vigilant and sober and to not be a disappointer of our Lord, not to be one who is away from what the Lord would have us to be. We are to be people that, that works in his kingdom and serve as the Lord would have us to. In Matthew Rather, in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12, we're told with regard to being awake and, and vibrant that uh, the days of our years are three score and ten. And then he says, so teach us in verse 12, Psalms 90 and verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We're to use the opportunities that we have. James says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we shall go into such a city, and thereby and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be upon the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. 
We are to be people that recognize that time is valuable. We are only here upon the earth for a short period of time. And we're told in John chapter 4 and verse 35, Say not there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Jesus said, I say unto you, the fields are white already unto harvest. We need to see the opportunity and have the kind of attitude that our Lord had. In John 4, 9 and verse 4, he said, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. And so as we think with regard to all of this, we are to awake out of our sleep, we're to seize the opportunities that are there and to use them to the glory of God and to the advancement of his cause and kingdom. That's Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 that says it's high time to wake out of sleep. But then there's a statement in Ephesians chapter 5 in verses 14 through 21 that I want us to give attention to as we look at the rest of the lesson. And there are a number of points that are made in this. We will look at them point by point, seven different points from Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 14 and reading on down through verse uh, 21 of, um, of this chapter. Ephesians 5 and um, now let me here we are. Ephesians 5 and verse 14. Paul says, Wherefore, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give thee light. See that you walk circumspectly, and not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So here's a passage then, and I hope you'll keep that passage open as we go along in our study because we will be looking at it verse by verse as we think with regard to the matter of being a person that is wide awake far as the, the Lord's kingdom is concerned. I'm going to bring up a couple of eyes here as we have one. Well, we've got, we got both of them now. Uh, I wanted to have a, a person with their eyes wide open, and when I asked for eyes that were wide open, they only gave me one you make and detect that the other one there is just reversed. It's the same eye. That's, that's the same eye up there twice is what you've got. But we need to be people who are wide-eyed, as it were, wide awake, sober, vigilant, all of those things. And as we move along into this, let's look at the first point under this as we suggest the idea that we are to have our eyes open so that we can live Carefully, Ephesians 5 and verse 15 says, See that you walk circumspectly. King James Version says circumspectly. The uh, Revised Version suggests the idea to walk carefully. That's what circumspectly means. We are to walk carefully. Have you ever walked through a darkened room and couldn't see where you're going and stumbled over something along the way? And if you didn't hurt your toe, you may have fallen on your face and hurt your face. But anyway, it is not a good thing for a person to walk carelessly. We are to walk carefully, spiritually, not just physically. We don't want to fall. We certainly do not want to fall uh, physically. But above everything, we really ought to be people that do not fall spiritually, who walk very, very carefully. Now, the other passage, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time, Paul says. We live in a world of people who are looking at Christians' lives in a very critical way. 
They look for faults in your life. Someone has said, you may be the only Bible that your neighbor will read. They may not read the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they will read the gospel according to you and try to determine whether or not you're genuine and sincere or whether you're hypocritical. And we need to live careful lives before our neighbors and before our family and before our little children. We need to live very carefully lives because they walk in our steps and they are influenced by the kind of life that we live. And then the next point that we want to look at as we think about this matter is that we are to see the opportunities. We are to see the opportunities that are there. The Greeks looked upon opportunity as a, as a lady who only had one, one lock of hair and it was on the front. And the point of all of this was if you're going to seize the opportunity, you have to see it, you have to see it coming. She didn't have a lock of hair for her to grab, people to grab a hold on after she's passed. Opportunities that are passed are just wishful thinking for us. We need to be ready for the opportunities and to seize the opportunities. But what does the scripture say? In, Matthew, in Ephesians 5 and verse 15 and 16 put together, it says, See that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It's too late after it's already passed by. We need to use the time while the time is there, while the opportunity is there. The statement in Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 2 says, Thou knowest not what, the, what evil shall be upon the earth. And there's another passage underneath this. It comes up, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. As we have uh, therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them which are of the household of faith. The Christian has responsibility to others, but it is a, one that is connected with opportunity. As you therefore have opportunity, we need to look for the opportunity, use the opportunity, and do it to the glory of God and to the advancement of the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we are to be people that are wide awake as Christians, carefully in our living and seeing the opportunity. And the third point is that we need to be people that study God's holy word. We're to study God's holy word, and this passage makes that point in verse 17. You see how that we've looked at verse 15, 16, and 17. In verse 17, it says, Therefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. How can we understand what the will of the Lord is unless we study what the Bible teaches with regard to the will? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We're to know the will. We need to be people to study. And that passage in Acts, Acts chapter 17, 11 says, These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, talking about the Bereans, that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were a people that studied, that laid up God's word, and if you look underneath this, we'll find that uh, the statement here, study to show thyself approved unto God as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Not to please the preacher. Preacher will talk about getting that calendar and being a daily Bible reader, but it's not to please the elders or the preacher or anybody else, but it's to do what God would have us to do. We need to be people who live carefully, see the opportunities, study the Word of God as this passage, would, and be not un, unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And the fourth point in this, we need to be people who really don't just read it, but really think about it. Meditate upon what God's word says. Here in this passage he says, Be not drunk with wine, but wherein is excess, but fill with the Spirit. He cometh because we have been studying the word of God, laying it up within our hearts, meditating upon these things. And as in Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. We delight in so many 
things. In reading the newspapers, television, talking on the telephone, all kinds of communication, but we need to have the communication that comes from above. And we need to think about these things. And this passage says that we are, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We need to be people that do that to be pleasing, acceptable in the sight of our God. And the next point now as we move along in this is that it says we are to sing praises. If you read this passage through, you'll find that the 19th verse is saying, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. How does that fit in with living carefully, seeing the opportunity, studying the Bible, meditating upon all of that? We need to study, we need to sing, but not just when we come to services, not just when we come to church. We need to sing praises to God whenever we have an opportunity. It has a, a lifting influence upon our hearts and upon our lives. Uh, I think of other passages in this connection. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. We are to be a singing people. I have another passage we'll bring up in this. It says with regard to Paul and Silas, they were on that missionary journey and in prison. It says at midnight, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. They weren't in worship services. They weren't just having a prayer, rather having a song before the Lord's Supper. They were singing praises even in that prison, and the prisoners heard them. And another passage in this connection. Matthew chapter 26, it says, and this is right after the, right after the Lord's Supper had been instituted, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. It says, and when they had sung an hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is Jesus and his disciples here. They had instituted the Lord's Supper. Now what I'm saying is, of course we sing in worship services, but we are to sing on other occasions too, whether in prison or whether we are with a group of people as the Lord was with these disciples. They sang a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. Singing should be a part of the Christian's life. It influences us in a very, very powerful way. And then think with me also, we're told to be thankful. Be thankful. In Ephesians 5 verse 20, it says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to sing praises to God and we are to give thanks to God for all things in all, uh, in, through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many passages that could be placed in this connection. In Psalms chapter 100 and verse 4 it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. I believe that we are a lot more thankful than we are thoughtful enough to express it. Many times if you were to ask the Christian, are you grateful for things that God has done? And then ask, well, have you thanked him for that? No, I haven't thanked him. Haven't thanked him, but I'm grateful. We need to be grateful enough to give thanks to God. In Luke chapter 17, 17, a very familiar passage because of what had happened, the Lord had encountered ten lepers. Ten lepers, and he had healed all ten of them. He had sent them on their way, and as they went on their way, as he had commanded them, they were healed. And then there was one that came back, just one. And Jesus said, where were not the ten cleansed? And where are the nine? Incidentally, the one that came back was a Samaritan. You would think that the Jews would have been taught enough that they would have been appreciative enough, but no, no. It was a Samaritan despised by the Jews, and the Lord made that point. It was 
that stranger, as it were, that had returned to give thanks to God. May God help us to be grateful and thankful and to express that kind of thoughtfulness and thankfulness to him. So, wide awake. One more point. As we think with regard to this, we are to be humble Christians. And the passage in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Not proud, not haughty, not arrogant people, not filled with that kind of attitude. But on the other hand, we are to be people that submit ourselves to one another. We are to love one another. We are to serve one another. That little song that we sing at the beginning of Bible class, our servant song, Jesus was a servant. We're to walk in his steps. We're to do as he did, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then the statement in James chapter 4 and verse 6, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Wide awake. Well, I hope everybody's wide awake right now. I have been known to look out in the audience and see somebody wide asleep. And by that I mean they're just, they're just sunk down in the pew. They're so, they're so sleepy that I, and I, I've, I've worked on jobs where I felt like I couldn't stay awake in class. And if I just had a pillow, I could really sleep a little bit and do much, much better. Maybe you felt that way in church from time to time. But God help us to be awake, not just in church, to be awake as Christians, as Christian parents, as young people, the opportunities that are before us, live carefully, study the Bible, meditate upon its word, be people that sing praises and are thankful to God and are Christians that are humble in the service of the Lord. Now, it takes humility to obey the gospel of Christ. There are people who will argue and argue about what is necessary for years and years and never obey the gospel of Christ. We could do it in just a few minutes. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and are you willing to confess your faith in him, to turn in repentance to him, and to be baptized into Christ? When they said in Acts 2, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He wasn't giving them a suggestion. They said, what must we do? He told them what they must do, and it's what we must do. If you're away from God today as one who's not a Christian, why not today? Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead. Be a faithful, wide-awake Christian, serving the Lord as you should. If you've fallen away, drifted away, don't lose your soul because of it. You can make it right today. And our prayer is that you will, as together we stand and as we sing. Oh.